Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. A podcast is a personally oriented discussion centered all around select topics. And today's topic is all about unleashing the power of AI for RIA advisors. Is it the end of the world or a brand new world of opportunity? Our panelists today are going to answer that question. Number one is Chris Engelbert, Chief Investment Officer over at Engelbert Financial Advisors. We got Bradley Rathy, Chief Investment Officer at Strategic with an IQ Financial Group, and Tim Ireland, Director of Product at QDEC. Who am I? I'm Will Tarashuk, the founder of Willie T Productions, a professional podcast host, and your humble moderator for this panel. So let's not waste any more time. Let's talk some money, talk some tech, let's cool some nerves. This whole AI thing can be kind of scary. So, without further ado, let's get right on into it. Gentlemen, 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 this has been a long time coming. And I am so excited to be here with all of you. So, Chris, Brad, Tim, welcome to the panel. Welcome to the uh, the panel, moderating, whatever we want to call this. I call it a podcast. Some people call it a webinar. It really is the same thing. So, let's please start off, introduce ourselves. We're going to go around the horn. Chris Engelbert is kicking it off with you. Yeah, Chris Engelbert, Engelbert Financial Advisors. Brad. Brad Rathy, CIO of uh, Strategic. And Tim, you are a tech man. (laughs) Absolutely. And um, your background is in uh, research as well as product. Excellent, excellent. So we're here to talk all about AI in the RIA space. So let's just kick it off right there. Gentlemen, are you currently using AI within your RIA? What is your current relationship with AI? So Chris, Mr. Engelbert. My friend. Yeah, uh, it's something that uh, we've been very excited to explore. And uh, probably over the last 18 months, uh, we've really been dabbling in it. And it's accelerating the last probably three to six months. Uh, I really think there's going to be three areas. I mean, from our use that we've been using it, um, you know, the big three areas are going to be client communication. Mm -hmm. Uh, We happen to use a product that we stumbled on last December, uh, a company called Levitate. And they have quickly integrated AI uh, into their marketing. Uh, So Levitate basically uh, is an off the shelf way to get, you know, emails out to clients uh, and prospects very quickly. It kind of circumvents, uh, you know, some of the other products there where people end up, uh, when you market, you have stuff going to your junk mail. So Levitate uh, uses your actual own email address. And it's a very interesting, you know, product from that standpoint, but they just upped the ante a couple of months ago. Uh, they added a, uh, uh, AI feature that if you're looking to write your own email about maybe required minimum distributions or, you know, what's going on in the markets, you can write a couple of lines and the AI jumps in and literally helps you with writer's block because, you know, hopefully most investment advisors are much better investment advisors than they are, uh, you know, authors. So it's really helped me from that standpoint, uh, you, you know, overcome like, hey, I got to send out an email and I want to talk about this. And all of a sudden it helps to fill in, you know, what I want to talk about. And of course we go in and edit it. So I like it from a marketing standpoint as well. All right. And Brad, like ChatGBT, that's pretty much the main AI tool I think most people know. Do you have any experience with ChatGBT or how else do you use AI? And I guess in your businesses. I have used it. Um, so I have about 30 plus years of experience in, in the investment. You know, we started off in alternatives, moved to consulting on alternatives, and then I've been in the RA business for about 10 years. I actually wrote Neural Nets back in the early 90s. And we did, we really, it's kind of the early part of what kind of chat GPT is. And realized from an investing standpoint, it really wasn't, you know, the best, you know, ideas. However, we have used ChatGPT. You know, I think the generative AI is extremely powerful. You know, we've used it a couple of different ways, but obviously there's a bunch of pitfalls to it. And we're going to talk about that today. But we are using it. Uh, and I, I'm more with Chris on it's more on a communication. We've done some on the on the investment and putting models together and some of those things. Uh, and we can talk about that a little bit later. But yes, we are we are using it. I think it's you know of in the last 30 years, what are some of the bigger changes that we've seen in the last 30 years? I would put it up there as I think one of the more important um, directions to go and creating should create incredible efficiencies if you if you use it in the right way. Well, yeah. I want to I, I want to jump on something that Brad said there because Please. you know I equated to you know when ETFs came blowing onto the market, uh, you know all of a sudden ETFs 
are here and RIAs are like, how do we use them? And now you, every RIA practice out there is using exchange traded funds to create uh, portfolios for clients. And I, I see the same thing happening uh, you know, with AI, that it's, a, it's another tool in the toolbox, uh, probably one of the best tools I've seen in the last 10 years. I mean, it's definitely a tool. And I think when the new tool gets introduced, it also brings some fear. But, you know, Brad, you kind of mentioned it that 30 years, right? It's kind of evolved over time because it's kind of like, to me, it's it's what's old is new again. So, Tim, you being the tech guy, you know, AI is new, but it's newer. Like, I think of social media algorithms, right? That is literally an AI telling you what you want to see and hear every single day. So is AI really this brand new thing or is it just a new adoption on an old technology? I I think that's a fantastic question because if we look at the research that's led to this modern kind of explosion of large language models, which is the technology behind things like ChatGPT and Mm -hmm. a lot of the things, including some of the technology that we've built at QDAC, it really isn't you know, something that's kind of come on the scene in the last few years, it's more the culmination of research, excuse me, of research that's been going on for decades. Uh, you know, it really, um, this most recent kind of evolution has its roots, at least going back to around 2010. Um, but and you can even look back to the early 2000s and some of the kind of deep belief networks. Um, there's a guy who's been in the news recently, Jeffrey Hinton, uh, who contributed a lot of the early research there. I think to summarize, it really is not so much that this technology is brand new, but that in terms of the usability, in terms of the interfaces, in terms of the capacity for someone who's not a scientist to interact with it, it's reached above that threshold where now it's useful for a much broader variety of professionals than it used to be. It isn't too that the like NVIDIA and some of the technology just wasn't there, right? I mean, isn't that a bit of it too, that we finally kind of moved beyond and NVIDIA and some of these other chip makers have made it so it's available to everybody because otherwise even the cost of these things is crazy, but it definitely starting to come down. You have that exponential curve of what used to require a supercomputer requires a server. What used to require a server requires a workstation. What used to require a workstation will run on your phone. And the next step is quantum computing. But that's a conversation for another day. Tim, you and I can deep into that in another time. But let's Definitely. swing it back to RIA advisors and just investing in general. Because really, AI, what people say, it's a time saver. And that is both a good and potentially a bad thing. So, Chris, you using AI, how much time does it really save you in your day-to-day? And what are the costs and benefits of uh, costs and analysis and benefits of all of that? Yeah, I mean, you know, they always say they only, you know, they only make so many hours in a day, which is true. And I, I've run into advisors working 10, 12 hour days. And, you know, I'm like, what are you guys doing? Um, you know, I, what, what I look for it as, like I said, from a marketing standpoint, if it can save me a half an hour, 45 minutes writing a proposal or writing a marketing piece or back testing, you know, an investment model, you add up 15 minutes here, half an hour there you're getting back three, four hours a week, at least is what you're doing. Um, And and I think that's why, you know, the financial services industry is looking at it because if you, you know, we have a small team at our shop, there's three of us, uh, we're managing just over a hundred million dollars. I believe that without adding any additional, you know, I hate to say this human bodies, it would be very easy to, you know, easily manage 200, 250, 300 million uh, as a small practice. And again, it's because AI, you know, like Tim said, it, it's kind of getting integrated in every aspect out there, whether it's marketing, uh, you know, client services, uh, you know, portfolio management, just that extra, you know, 15 minutes to a half an hour a day, you know, really adds up as far as an advisor goes. We Oops. definitely, i oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Tim, please. Just uh, to jump on that, you know, I think at least from our perspective, kind of building tools for advisors at QDEC, we think of it as extending your capabilities. You know, like where can we save you time or where can we take a process that would normally be tedious, that would normally require like learning how to use a specialized tool? How can we take that and make it something where you can come to a brand new experience, use it on the first time and get a good result, you know, and, uh, and really make it so that 
as the advisor, your skills in interacting with your clients and analyzing their situation and knowing what's right for their portfolio and, and helping them, you know, you can extend that to more clients and to, uh, you know, use that to grow your business. Well, and just to, just to add on what Tim said. So one of the things that, you know, takes up a lot of my time is, uh, you know, we all have retail clients and they all watch, you know, the financial news and they'll call in about, Hey, I just saw XYZ stock. Well, we took CNBC on the TV out of our office probably eight years ago. We don't miss it. But again, you got somebody like, Hey, what about XYZ stock? And I'm, you know, I, I full disclosure, I've worked with a QDEC team. Uh, and what I'm very excited about is that, you, you know, that query function, like, you know, what's going on with Johnson and Johnson today? Why is it up $3? And all of a sudden you see this whole list of, you know, you're like, Hey, Mrs. Smith, Here's what's happening with Johnson and Johnson today. I mean, it makes you look a lot smarter, but again, it's a tool. So rather than me saying, let me call you and get back, I can be like, hey, here's what you know what's happening with it, you know, today. I, I think that is probably the most understated and to me, one of the most valuable aspects of what's going to be happening with, you know, AI. Right. It, it undeniably saves time. But that could mean also that you could take on more clients. But if you've got to take on more clients, it means you could also hire more agents. So Chris, you say you're a team of one to three, right? If one person can do a 40 hours of work in half the time, you know, correct me my math here, but it means two people could do even more or three yeah. people could do even more. And if you're saving money, you know, that's easier to hire more people. Or if someone is like looking to start out, they can use RIAs, um, look, use these, these tools to kind of launch their own business and try to get ahead of some people who might not be technologically savvy. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here so Brad, kind of just expand on that a little bit. Like with all the time and money it's saved, it's easier to scale or does it mean it's easier to cut back? And which should RAs be focusing on? Well, everybody's about growth. I mean, I was going to of course. pipe in when Chris was talking and obviously growing takes work too. And part of that is communication and having a constant communication. You're out there, name recognition. And the biggest thing we've used it for is idea generation. So I've given some talks at different conferences this year. And what I'll normally do is say, okay, here's the, here's my talk. It's on alternatives. It's on, on this or some, something relevant in the news. I'll come up with some ideas and then I'll put it through uh, QDEC or ChatGPT and come up with additional ideas and kind of help me formulate what I'm trying to do. And it cuts down my time in half for sure. And that's the part that I'm really excited about. And the other thing that we talk about is everybody's so busy. We have, I think, 18 advisors that that uh, work work for us and having them come up with ideas to have talks about or writing papers or is really a challenge right there like like chris is saying everybody's already working 50 hours a week do they really want to come up with a paper that we want to do a white paper on or or this subject we try to give them ideas and they just don't even think about it so that idea generation is so helpful, helps you formulate it, and you can send it to them and say, hey, here is a edited, here's a rough copy of, of an idea. They instantly go in there. It's so much easier to edit than it is to come up with that original idea. Mm -hmm. And ChatGPT or QDEC does a phenomenal job. And we can uh, we can talk about, maybe Tim wants to talk about that difference between sure. coming up with that idea generation in a ChatGPT versus the QDEC and what those differences are. And I think that's incredibly yeah. important because I know we're going to get to compliance and everybody loves compliance clients, including me. Yeah. And, but we can talk a little bit about, I don't know, Tim, you want to talk okay, a little yeah, bit I about jump that? In there a little bit yeah, jump too. in. He, he, he said the buzzword. He said, he said <laughs> QDEC. So please Tim, explain, explain no. what all that is and yeah. what, what, what the tool is and how it works. Absolutely. You know, that we um, are really excited about the AI capabilities that we're rolling out with QDEC. And uh, the biggest one there is a tool that we call QAdvisor, which is our AI powered chat. And what we focused on with that experience is instead of like fine tuning a large language model to give, you know, a finance flavored uh, chat experience, really honing in on the connection between the primary source information and what you get as a user when you ask a question. Because we want to build a tool for professionals like Chris and Brad, where when they come in, they ask a question, they get an answer 
that has a direct connection to every source that was used to compose that answer. You know, so I come in and say, what happened to Johnson & Johnson today? It's going to show me, this is the Reuters article that said that, you know, Johnson & Johnson acquired so-and-so, right? And by focusing on that flow of information and really instead of working on the AI as like a generator of novel text or novel ideas, more treating it as an interface between the user's questions and all of this raw information that's coming from these primary sources, right? That's not actually generated by the AI. Um, that's been a, a sort of unique way for us to build a really functional tool using this technology. That's been a lot of our focus is how can we take this really powerful technology, but employ it in ways that are easy for us to understand what it's doing, easy for us to see the value in, and know, you know, how is it going to use that information? How is it going to provide that value to our users like Chris or Brad or any RIA, any financial professional? All right, Tim, I'm going to pick your brain a little bit here because uh, <laughs> right. I'm going to get really techie and meta with you. Uh, no pun intended on meta, but AI revealing its sources. I think that's huge, right? When you do a Google search, it gives you literally sources. Now, yes. when that chat GPT thing or BARD thing, it doesn't necessarily give you sources unless you ask for it. So how important are sources with AI, one, for credibility, yeah. two, for trust, and three, just to just so you know you're getting the right information. So how does an right. AI platform really pool in sources? Give me some of the background code and how all that yeah. works. I, so it's really, it, this is pretty critical because when you look at just a large language model on its own, um, it doesn't have an innate ability to tell you where its information came from. Hmm. That when that model's trained, what it learns how to do is associate words with each other in a, um, in a way that allows it to kind of predict sequences of words. So you give it the beginning of a sentence and it learns how to predict what should come afterwards, or you give it the end of a sentence and it learns how to predict what should be at the beginning. And the problem with that is the thing that it's like memorizing or the thing that it's learning is those relationships, not the actual sequences of words. Now, if you imagine, um, and perhaps relatable for people who spend uh, a lot of time looking at financial markets like ourselves, um, you know, if you know the relationships, if you know the returns and you uh, have similar enough returns, then the, the price chart needs to look similar as well. So if I look at equities that have, you know, returns from the same sector, then their price charts will look similar. And in the same way, the AI, by learning relationships between words, will eventually memorize some of the text itself as well. So it'll memorize Harry Potter, or it'll memorize different pieces of encyclopedias as it's trained on them, but not in a way where it can reliably retrieve where that information came from, because it doesn't have a dictionary to look up and see, oh, well, this paragraph came from the Deathly Hallows. And so what needs to be done and what Bard does and what um, Bing's search feature does and what QDEC does in different ways is start with new primary source information and give that to the AI when you're trying to answer the question or when you're trying to create the response. You can't rely on that information being learned by the AI ahead of time. You actually need to provide it on the spot when you're going to go and get that answer. Because otherwise, you can't rely on the connection between the primary source and the answer being preserved. Well, and how, so does that, how does it yeah. define a source, right? Because if, like, if, right. if it pulls from like a lot of the big names, right? like the mm -hmm. industry term, um, yeah. authoritative news, right? But so how does it s source all those out? Does it also include like independent sources? Because sometimes the, the, That's a great question. The, the, the trustworthy sources are wrong. Like if, yeah. if it gives me something Jim Cramer says, I'm going to go the other way. Right? <laughs> right. So how does it source out? Um, That's a great like question. New sources. And Chris, I want to flip for you to, to um, 
rebut mm-hmm. that. Like when you're looking at these sources, do you want independent sources? Do you want to be stuck in the CBC, Reuters, and all these other sources? So how is one? How is it sourced out independent news? And Chris, yeah. who is an RAA, do you want to see that independent news as well from your AI? I was gonna say so. I'll, I'll and I'll I'll give the the answer for how QDEC does things. And and uh, right now our approach is you know, eventually we would like to be able to tell our users this is the consensus from a bunch of different news articles. Currently, our path towards that is we're going to let you as a user choose which sources you want to see. So you have a box to check that says, I want to see articles from writers, or I want to see CNBC, or I want to see Financial Times. And as we kind of grow our database, our intention is to include all those sources down to your little financial blogs. Um, but uh, I definitely am interested to uh, turn the mic over to Chris and, and hear, you know, uh, his perspective on which sources are the most valuable. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, so. I, I think we're on a precipice of if you think about how radio and TV have evolved over the last 10 years, the same things happening with news information and AI. Um, and yeah, I want to see the real reliable sources. I want to see it, you know, hey, uh, you know, a little footnote, Reuter, whatever. So I know where it comes from because obviously, you know, that'll be very important for compliance, uh, you know, more important than what people think. But I, I, what I'm getting excited about is we're in this transformational change where everybody used to listen to radio in real time. Yeah. Not many people, I mean, that's going down to the point where, you know, obviously people listen to podcasts. Everybody used to watch TV in real time. Remember those days getting, you know, eight o'clock on a Friday. People don't do that. You have the streaming services. So what I, what I think is coming in the next five, maybe not even the next five years, I think you're going to see JP Morgan, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs, uh, all the major, you know, uh, investment firms, uh, you know, Brad's firm, my firm, you know, all the stuff that we put out there is going to become a source for AI to be able to go in and sample and say, here's the, you know, the view on what, you know, is going on in the economy, or here's the forecast for earnings or whatever. And I, I, I to be honest with you, I think it's going to level the playing field, you, you know, because if you think about it from a trading standpoint, Goldman Sachs has spent billions of dollars using AI to scan the news and buy or sell stocks in a millisecond. Well, yeah. you know, our firm doesn't have billions of dollars to do the same kind of thing. So we have to kind of sit back. But I, I believe the day is going to be coming where we're going to be getting those nuggets of financial information where, hey, uh, you know, I query the ba- database and go, what are the top performing stocks year to date in the S&P 500? And the list of stocks come down. And I look at my portfolios and I say to AI, what portfolios of mine own those stocks or don't own those stocks? Should I be changing the portfolio composition of what's going on? So again, you know, right. from a 30,000 foot view, you know, the, the transformative transformation of, of, you know, radio TV, it's happening in the financial services information area where financial services information and how it's dispersed is, is forever changed. I mean, I remember mm-hmm. way back in the day, and I hate to bring this up when the Challenger shuttle, you know, crashed, mm-hmm. we had an old Reuters machine in the back. And if you heard one ding, it was important news. Two dings, it was pretty, really important news. Three dings, it was really important. I'll never forget the day. It went ding, 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 ding. Well, I think what you're going to be able to do in a not so distant mm-hmm. future is like, hey, I want to know this is right. the largest holding at our RIA firm across all of our clients. I want to know every news item that comes on this ETF or this stock or, you know, whatever. So I can be like, Hey, do we sell? Do we buy? You know, what do we do with it? So again, that change is rapidly coming. So you'd like, you'd almost like the AI to be able to tell you which sources are relevant and which ones are going to give you the best information. Oh yeah. Because right, right now what's happening is again, we make fun of Kramer and there's an inverse Kramer fund out there. But again, (laughs) that's, that's where most people are. Most retail investors are getting their news. So when they call me up and go, Kramer says to buy this, I'll be like, okay, I can tell you where the source is from that and what happened with it. I I think we're talking that internal knowledge management. And you yeah. hear Morgan Stanley's going that direction. Mm-hmm. I, I saw that uh, CEO of PIMCO recently had a conversation with him. That's what PIMCO is doing. They're internal that they can uh, ask any question. They can look at all the different reports. And I think that is probably the next level up. And I know there's some things that uh, QDEC is working on as well, that you can have your own 
internal uh, knowledge management. And so but I'm like, Chris, I want to see it all on election night. Let me tell you, I go from CNN to right. MSNBC to Fox. I want to see it all. I want to understand where the polls are and kind of how we're going to navigate it. It's amazing watching on election night. You think it's a completely different election, right? You, you right. go in on listen right. to Fox. They're saying one thing. You're going to MSNBC or whatever. And so you want to know it all. I do. I think it's important. You know, you want to have it credible, but you do want to know it all. I think that's the big difference. What you're doing, Tim, is this idea that you can give access to all of it and you know it's real information, not like ChatGPT where it can make up some information. And, and it's a bit of an egomaniac that if it doesn't know the information, it's going to just make it up. That is not what you're doing. And I think that's incredibly, incredibly important yeah. to what you're doing versus, let's say, what a ChatGPT is. But let me say one thing about how this is going to evolve. I don't think, and maybe I'm a maybe I'm fooling myself. I don't think it's replacing me. I don't think it's replacing Chris. I think it is, but I do think that entry level programmer, I think that is where it's going to impact. There was a great article in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago talking about it. And I think it's going to impact that, you know, that uh, first level analyst. I, I think there's going to be a bunch of things that are going to be impactful. I think it's making us much more efficient, it's cost savings, everything else you want to talk about. But I do think there is some people that are going to uh, be displaced a little bit from this, not to yeah. say that, um, you know, they're, they're not going to be around, but I think it's going to make everybody smarter, faster uh, to a certain extent on this entry level person. But I do think that's where it is going to be more impactful than let's yeah. say the advisor's gone. I, I think that's, that, that think, makes no sense to me. No, I totally agree. I think you do have to have clear eyes with it. Um, you know, is that we don't see it um, as replacing professionals and people with experience, but it definitely can take over the responsibilities of someone who is junior, where a lot of the work that they would be doing is the more rote stuff. Um, and so that's something that how you want to position or how you want to use the product is, is definitely, or any AI product, right? Not just QDEC. Um, is it a training tool to help accelerate that person up to a more experienced level? Um, is it a tool so that you can have one person in that role do the work of four or two or one and a half? Um, and, where, and where are those people going to be in like three no. to five years, right? It's like the, these entry level people learning this tool three to five years where are they going to be and how is that where they're going to be affect Wall Street? Because at this next generation of investors or advisors, right, they're going to be advising on the future. So what does that mean? Like with all these AI tools, how is that going to one level the play a field and two, where are they going to how is it levels it out? Where are they going to be in three to five years? Well, I, I actually think uh, just to address that it, it's going to help them with their learning curve. I mean, I, you know, Brad might attest to this. I, I think you got to be in this business at least 10 years to be wow. able to figure out, you know, some of the, you know, connections between, you know, what's a PE and what's the convexity of the yield curve and all this stuff. And, you know, so I, I think for the new advisors, it's going to help shorten the learning curve dramatically, uh, you know, as far as introduction to the technical terms, introduction into the relationships between, you know, the, the markets, currencies versus fixed income versus equities. So, I, you know, I see it as a positive because, you know, nowadays to sit down, you know, I, I, I kid, you know, about my kids going to YouTube university. Uh, but, you know, I, I see this where you can say to a young advisor, I need you to learn about, you know, you know, the energy sector and what the earnings forecast for the next couple of years is. And the person, instead of taking three days to figure it out and, and read up and do some research can come back to you in three hours. And I think it's going to help the young advisor, you know, really shorten that learning curve, which, you know, it's a long learning curve in the financial industry. I'm still learning every day. So. so so let me ask you this, Chris, with the YouTube University, right? I use YouTube University. YouTube mm -hmm. University is phenomenal. Yeah. So if I can use AI or YouTube University, why do I need an advisor, right? Like if, if tools like this are so handy and useful, is this something that the public can use or why, why should an AI, an RIA use this as opposed to general public? And how is that going to make them, both the client and the advisor, get ahead? 
Yeah, I think you're on to something, uh, you know, because a lot of people have asked me the same thing, and I always draw the analogy. We're getting into NFL football season. Training camp starting this week, and I always say to people, when you watch a professional football team and you see there's like 50 players on the sidelines, but there's like another 50 people on the sidelines, those are all coaches, linebacker coaches, wide receiver, quarterback coaches, et cetera. And so, you know, the, the robo-advisors, you know, could this be the next – generation of robo advisors probably sure uh but you got to remember the investment markets uh, are extremely emotional they're extremely psychological and you know we saw that uh during the global financial you know crisis and we saw that uh you know most recently during the pandemic where a lot of people literally you know sell at the bottom and buy at the top so i, I you know again could people do it themselves? Absolutely. But I always have the phrase that even world-class athletes have performance coaches, and that's what we are as advisors. It yeah, comes I back. I think it comes back to what do we do, right? What are, what is any, What's the value of an advisor? And I think there's no doubt we do this 50 hours a week, and we know a decent amount about the markets and what's going on. And obviously the emotional side, like Chris was talking about, I think that's incredibly important. And obviously the tax management and the estate planning and all those things, that's what we do. The investment part is obviously a piece of it. And to me, I think it's an important piece. And there is still, we can add a lot of value from that standpoint, but there's so much more the advisor does comparatively, you know, so, and that's where I think it, it comes down to where AI can't replace that part. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think that's where the value comes in. But you're I'm also going to, oh, sorry, Tim, to cut you off, but you're also going to no, have good. to convince these younger customers, like my yeah. specifically. We love Reddit. Wall Street bets <laughs> popped off. A lot of people made a lot of money. A lot of people lost all their money. <laughs> right. And that and that comes, you're going to have that snarky kid fresh out of college. I don't need to waste money on you. I can do all of this myself. And I need you guys to really prove to me that no, 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 you need to use an advisor. Now, other than that, I would just right. say, good luck. Have fun coming back to me when you're broke. Exactly. <laughs> well, I, I would jump into from the, uh, from this perspective of kind of working with the AI, right. And developing these tools. The problem with, well, I, I'd say the problem, um, one of the pitfalls of large language models is they're so good at writing compelling narratives because they were trained on, you know, billions of Reddit posts <laughs> and trained on, you know, the entire corpus of great English literature and trained on most of the good content on the internet and also a lot of the bad. And so in my opinion, as someone pretty close to the technology is they're nowhere near ready to tell you what to do with the information. Mm. This is a tool so, that's- So when you, when you were designing, yeah. a, if you're designing a tool like this, yeah. do you keep that in mind? Like when you're designing a building like a tool like this, do you, do you think I might ruin a whole industry or do you think I don't want to no. do that, man? I don't want to be Oppenheim over <laughs> Oh, oh no, no, no. <laughs> well, so it's-, it's <laughs> and, and, uh, and Brad, like when you're using a tool like this, do you keep that in mind too? Like, hey man, if I'm working with a designer <laughs> here to build an app like this, do you think, hey man, I'm paying you not to replace me? <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not even like that because it's, <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious to us that that's not what this tool is going to do right you know that that's yeah. not what this technology is poised to do because ultimately you know it's going to be quite a while before the ai can tell you what to do with you know this news report about this 25 basis point rate hike <clears throat> the difference is with the right ai tool you can get all 30 of the major news publications about the FOMC meeting and the rate hike condensed into two paragraphs that just have the important points in five seconds, instead of needing to go and read all of that news. And then you can ask it some follow on questions and it'll tell you with citations of where every sentence came from. And, and that's really like, that's the, our goal where we want to get to is put that information in front of the expert but not, not do the decision-making for the expert. I'm not going to tell you what to do with that information about that rate hike, at least not yet. Yeah, you know, I, I think there's a lot more to do there. I think the critical thing is I was a consultant, you know, did hedge fund consulting for a while. Everyone needs to have that consultant mindset, which is you always want to 
move on to the next job or try to uh, anything that's repetitive, make it as efficient as you possibly can, train somebody else to do it. You're always moving on to more complicated tasks. And I think that's all we're doing here with AI. We are consultants finding things that we, what we can uh, you know, that is repetitive and, and easier. We're trying to simplify it and be able to pass it on to other people. To me, that's really what AI is doing. If you're a consultant, you have that mindset, you're always looking for, you know, the next job or moving on or trying to train other people. This is the perfect tool for you to be able to use to make people more efficient, make you more efficient. And that's to me, the consultant mindset. Well, Will, Will, just to follow up on your whole, you know, why young people should use an advisor. I mean, like I said, I mean, we've been through, Brad and I have been through this, you know, for a long time. And, you you know, you see, so, you know, going back to what Tim was saying, how this has been, you know, transformative as far as AI, et cetera. There have been firms using this for the last 15, 20 years. And I can name those firms, hedge fund firms, Long-term capital, a bunch of quants, they blew up. They lost billions of dollars. And in the last two years, let's talk about the meme stocks. There's been no less than five hedge funds who have blown up because of what's happening with the meme stock. So again, I see, you know, the not to say the dark side of AI, but, you know, again, to Brad and Tim's point, the information you put in is very important. And what you do with the answer is even more important because you can sit there and go, hey, AMC is extra you know, extremely overvalued, we should short it. Again, this is not a recommendation to do it, but <laughs> you you do it and then you blow up and then these kids are like, wow, man, what happened? I'm like, well, you had, you know, information and you were only looking at one side of it and yeah. this is why your puts expired worthless or whatever the case may be. So right. I, I think, uh, you, you know, people see hear of people making a lot of money. They don't hear of all those people that lost money, you know, doing some of these things that they shouldn't have been doing. Yeah. Yeah. And when it comes to AI as in general, education in general, right? When I'm learning from someone, I don't want to be told what to think. I want to be told how to think. So if I was going to work with you, Chris, or with you, Brad, or even with you, Tim, like, how do I think about the information this is giving me? How do I think about this AI? Now, Tim, let me ask you from a technical perspective of AI, is AI designed to tell you what to think? Or how to think. And then, Brad, the same question for you as mm-hmm. an RA advisor. Is your job to tell a client what to think or how to think? And how do those two worlds kind of clash and combine here? That's a great question. I think that um, if you just talk to a naked large language model, right? So if you just go to chat GPT, um, it will definitely, you can definitely get it to tell you what to think, right? Mm-hmm. It'll give you a confident narrative that sounds like it has ironclad conclusions. Um, and that's because, especially with the way that these models are trained with reinforcement learning after the kind of initial large language model is built, it really, uh, I'm gonna get anthropomorphize the model a little bit here. It really wants to have a nice narrative that, that it's, it's conditioned to produce text that has a strong logical flow and narrative to it. And a lot of that conditioning is to help prevent some of the worst edge cases where the model produces nonsense or offensive language or things like that. And so because of that conditioning that's been baked into the model, it will be very confidently wrong and it'll sound really compelling. (laughs) And so a lot of our engineering has been trying to move away from telling, having the model tell you what to think and more having that structure of here are the facts and how you can put them together. And if I understand you correctly, that's more of the how to think, you know, is here are the different pieces that are true, right? We're going to draw them directly from the primary sources, show you a connection to the primary source. And then you as an expert user are going to be able to combine that with your knowledge about the world to determine what is true and what you should do. We're not going to tell you what to do. We're not going to tell you to buy AMC or sell AMC. We are going to tell you this is what these different news sources have said, or this is what the financial data says in terms of your P ratios or standard deviations or what have you. All right. And Brad, uh, my follow-up question with like you take that information. So if an AI is telling you, 
pretty much what to think. How do you take that and transform it, transform it into here's how to think, not what to think? Or do you just tell the client what to think if that's what they want to hear? Is that will never work. <laughs> well, Chris and I would be out of business. Our main job and 90% of what we do is listen. Yeah. All we're doing is listen to the client and it doesn't really, in the end, to a certain extent, our opinion matters, but we're formulating that opinion based upon their financial goals, their risk tolerance. Everything is about that client. Yeah. I, I invest in a certain way. And actually I was reading an interesting book by Josh Brown talking about how I invest or how Chris invests. Yeah. There was a book about it that was interesting, but it doesn't really matter how I invest to a certain extent. They need to know our philosophy of how we do things. But in the end, it's all about that client. And I think that's the difference. You can ask great questions of AI if you've listened to what's going on and it can give you some ideas. And you know, I want to definitely get on the model development side because I know Chris and I both have kind of worked with that a little bit. But it's really communication. It is that client their risk tolerance, what they're doing, that's the most important part. And that's where I think this idea of where the advisor really, you know, plays a role in, in this this whole ecosystem. Right. Well, I right. think, to, oh, I think to jump on Brad, you, you know, again, I go back to, you know, how ETFs have become transformative for an RIA. You, you know, you see these firms like, like, you know, where I see this from a marketing standpoint, you know, really helping you know, younger AIs or, you know, people like Brad and myself that use these tools is we're able to stay out in front of the pack. Why, you know, again, there's a lot of AI, uh, RIAs, registered investment advisors that are basically going to die on the vine if they don't start using the newer tools. And we've seen that so far because you see firms that are growing and firms that are, you know, if, if you're not going forward, you're going backwards. And especially when it comes to marketing, uh, you know, I, I look for the day uh, you know, that we have AI hooked up to our website. Somebody gets on our website, they, they you know, we watch where they're going on the website or not. We, the AI watches where they go on the website. And the final conclusion is, would you like to schedule, you know, an appointment either virtual or in person with Chris and his team? And they click on it, our calendar comes up and boom, I walk in and it's already been done. And you shorten, you know, it's all about shortening that cycle. I mean, I hate to say, you know, our business is very simple, but our business is, you know, get ourselves out there for people, have them learn who we are, have them trust us, uh, and then have them become clients, bring the money in, open accounts, invest the money. It's the same thing over and over again. And, you know, AI can speed up that process like we talked about previously. So is this AI thing going to end up uh, going to the point where it's going to have a relationship with the client, right? So what's the relationship between the client and AI going to be? Brad, what do you think? Sorry, I was reading the question. One more time, Will. I was reading the question. Is, this, is this like this? What's explain like the relationship between the AI and the client, right? So, is will the AI have a relationship with the client? I'm not. I'm not talking about like the movie Her with uh, uh like the the, the 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 voice and what's his name, the yeah. Joker. I play the Joker, but I'm talking about like an actual relationship with their money, right? So, how is the a client and AI gonna have a relationship? I don't think in the end the client sees it. I mean, I, there you really. Um, I think it gets back to this whole compliance thing. You know, do you need to tell a, a client when you wrote an email and it was written by AI, do you need to say that AI wrote this email back to you? And you're seeing it with doctors. Doctors are already doing it with this idea. I know in, in, uh, out in Arizona, they're, they're doing it already that client asks a question. AI actually, you know, it, it'll pop up with a response back to them. And then it does say at the bottom that AI generated this, but I did confirm that the information is good. And then you send it. I don't think this rogue, all of a sudden AI is writing everything and we're just at the beach, right? I mean, Chris <laughs> and I just kind of, we're done. We're good. You know, I don't see that. I think it's really... I think you still have to have a professional in the middle and yeah. trying to interpret these things. I think it's incredibly important. I would love to go to the beach, you know, more often, but I don't think that's happening. Yeah, I really, I really don't. Now, let me yeah. tell you, I was there yesterday. Now the back, my the back, of my neck is all red. So <laughs> the beach can be a little overrated. But you, you touched upon, you touched upon um, disclosing disclosures. So. Let me ask you, legally or morally, because it is, let's be honest, AI is still the Wild West. Do you, as an RA advisor, have to disclose that you are using AI when you source information to your clients? And Chris, when you're using AI, do your clients want to know if you're using AI or, do they, or are they indifferent? 
Uh, they're mostly indifferent. I mean, I think there's this vague notion of, you know, the average retail client's like, hey, what is AI? And, you know, they want to know you're using it. And then, of course, if you go into in-depth, you know, like how we're using it, the eyes glaze over, like, okay, I'm talking about the convexity of the yield curve at the same time I'm talking about AI. I, I think it's more results driven. I mean, clients are, are, mm. are looking for advisors who are going to communicate with them on a regular basis, know that they care about them, schedule meetings, review their portfolios, understand, you know, like Brad said, you know, what, what really their needs are, uh, you, you know, you, you, you're, you've got their money, you're trying to manage their money so they can live off of the money. And it's always a nebulous question, you know, how much money do I need and how long, you know, before my money runs out. So they don't, I, I don't really say, see them caring that much. They just, they want results is what they want to do. Uh, and I think that's more important than anything else. And I think, again, going back to at the start of the, you know, uh, the podcast here, it's another tool in the toolbox uh, I think it's one of the most exciting tools to come on in the last 10 years. And I think, you know, it's going to continue to grow and evolve, like Tim pointed out. And I think you're going to see advisors that don't use it end up getting left behind versus advisors that do use it, you know, thrive and continue to grow their practice. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I, I don't care if you use it. I don't care if you disclose it. I just care that it works. At the end of the day, I want to see my portfolio go up right. and not go down. So if you're using AI, great. If you're not, also great, but if it's going down and you're using AI, you know that may make someone angry. And then, like, could they could they sue? Could they sue if like you're using AI to get my information now? And does those if there are any laws against? I'm assuming there aren't, but the laws that already yeah. exist, right? If someone someone can't sue you, or at least they can try to sue you for bad information, but that information came from AI. Are the current laws on the books going to protect you from that? Because so, it's like invest at your own risk. So please, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I can actually jump in there a little bit. And that's something um, I see a question in the Q&A also uh, asking about product and service that we offer that uh, uh, avoid making this an infomercial. But if you go to uh, qdeck.ai, you can see all about um, the product that we offer at QDEC. And uh, in our AI powered chat service, where you can get information about the news and about financial markets, um, we've taken a lot of care to make sure that every piece of information there is tagged to the primary source that it came from. And that's actually to avoid some of these very problems where when you have a piece of data, as a fiduciary, you wanna know where did that data come from? And it could be a problem if that data was not honest, if it was generated by the model and not coming from a reputable financial news source. So that's part of the reason why you can choose what sources you're drawing your data from because if you're making a report that you might want to distribute to your clients, maybe it's for like an email or a newsletter or something like that, then maybe you want to curate those sources to sources that are going to have the right tone for your clients and also that are going to have reliable information. Mm. But ultimately, those are decisions that you as the RA are going to make. From our perspective at QDEC, it's just about having and preserving that connection between whatever information we're going to distribute to our clients and the source that information came from. And we saw um, there's a pretty high profile case in New York of a lawyer who was using ChatGPT to do case research. Mm -hmm. And uh, without the kind of connection that we make in our tools between the primary sources and the output of the model, it's very easy for the system to hallucinate and generate brand new things. And so this lawyer was asking it about these cases that were totally fabulated, entirely, you know, not real cases at all. And it was confidently telling him about all of these things that happened in these totally made up cases. Um, you know, I do think that you have to be careful. And in that case, it was extremely embarrassing. I don't know if um, other than being embarrassed in the trial, I don't know if there were any other legal consequences, but I do imagine that eventually there will be. And that's part of what, you know, we decided when designing our product that we wanted to be out of that and make sure that there was always going to be a reliable connection between whatever you get and your, uh, you know, the, the primary sources that led to it. Well, I'd like to, can we talk a little bit on the model development side? I know we've talked a lot about the generative, which I really like, and I think is <laughs> unbelievably powerful, but I do think there is going to be some huge advancement on the model development side. 
I do think yeah. this betterment, the Schwabs, the Fidelis, the Vanguards, BlackRock, all these guys, they have a fiduciary problem with everything they're doing, in my opinion. They are not fiduciaries. They're using their own products. So they're making you put 10% in cash. I mean, they have all kinds of problems. To me, without a doubt, if you're using those models, that there is a better way. And I think some of the things that QDEC and some other players are starting to develop and some of the things that I've worked with, I know, I know Chris has worked on a little bit, there is no doubt that the models that we're working on will be way better than what they have out there on the robo side of things. I don't even call what we're doing on the, you know, really robo. I call it more smart, smart allocator, just because you're having dynamic, yeah. you're using better information. You have no, I don't care if it's BlackRock or Vanguard. I'm going to go with the cheapest, the bestest, the fastest, the ones that can jump the highest. That's what I'm going to use. All those other yeah. models out there, that is not what they're doing. And so to me, there is a lot of really interesting things going on on the AI side and the model development side. And you can ask it a question. I want to develop an income model that does this type of thing. And it can come back to you, say, here's here's an idea for model development and you can start to work on it. And it just, get, again, idea generation. And it gets away from that. It really comes back to fiduciary versus you know, what everybody else is doing. So I, I don't know, Chris, what you've done on it and what you think on the model development side, but I'm, I'm super excited. I think there's a ways to go with it. And I think there's a bunch of interesting things, but I'm super excited on that side. Yeah, uh, Brad, you're right on because we're already, uh, you, you know, we're using another company that is, you know, basically using a model to replicate some of the major indexes out there with a tax overlay strategy. So, you know, I think this is going to be the biggest development in taxable accounts in the next 10 years. Uh, because what's happening is you have, you know, all the baby boomers, uh, you know, we have, we're in the biggest intergenerational transfer of wealth ever. Nobody's talking about that. And the thing is, when these people inherit the money, most of the money they're inheriting is taxable. Some of it's in, you know, beneficiary IRAs, but what this other company is doing, uh, and, and this is, and they're using some AI. And also, I think this is where the QDEC product's going is allowing the ability of the RIA to pull levers. So, because what I ended up doing just last week uh, is that they had, uh, you, you know, their AI model was more oriented towards growth. When the client opened the account, I said, that's what we wanted to do. You know, some of my work was showing that growth was undervalued, no pun intended. And now growth is really run. And I contacted them last week. I'm like, we need to pull the levers on a model. We need to go, you know, more in a direction of you know dividends, et cetera. And they sent me back a super side-by-side -side comparison that their AI product had generated saying, okay, you know, here's what the portfolio is going to look like on a price to cash flow, price to sales, dividend, et cetera. And I know, you know, we've been working with QDEC doing the same thing, allowing the advisor to pull the levers, you know, at a particular time. And to me, the most important thing, of course, we got to get careful with compliance is back testing those models because yeah, you want to back test them and see, you know, did they work well or they didn't work well, you know, but more importantly, what did I get under, you know, different economic conditions? So yeah, Brad's yeah. exactly right. I mean, again, I, I, I go back to leveling the playing field and, you know, Goldman Sachs has spent billions of dollars, you know, developing programs that read headlines and buy and sell billions of dollars worth of, uh, you know, stock at one time. Not that we're going to be doing that, although I would like to, uh, <laughs> you know, buying and sell billings. But, you know, what it's going to do for our, you know, um, our, our average client is, again, you know, the point is they don't care how you're going to make money. They just want you to make money. And if we're using a better tool that allows us to develop the model, get the input, back test it, you know, I, I, I think that's, again, a game changer. Are there Absolutely. any projections, any projections for the future? So, like, 10 years, let's say you have a portfolio in 10 years, one guy uses an RAA who uses AI, one guy doesn't. Are there any projections how one who uses AI is going to outperform when it doesn't or vice versa? Here, here's the numbers that we put together, and this is something I work a lot on, is this idea of what is our value? What is our alpha? What are we bringing to the table? My goal is 
one and a half to two and a half percent over a generic, let's say, benchmark. That is my goal on an annual basis over a longer time period. There's certain years. Last year we did a lot. This year it's obviously much tougher, as Chris would, would you know, uh, was talking about earlier. But I do think that it has the potential of adding. It's an. It's not five hundred. I, you, I think you're fooling yourself with that. But I think it is has a potential of adding you know, 50 to 100 basis points over what you're doing now. And that's all we're looking for. And 100 basis points over a 10-year period is a lot of money. And that's what we're trying to do with clients. In this idea that, oh, I want to, I want to make 25% every year, that's, that's not what we're trying to do. This is, we're not a hedge fund. We are trying to incrementally add things that can add alpha. And I think this is one of those tools that can add that 50 to 100 basis points. And that's what we're trying to do. And it also depends, right, on the client's objectives, right, and how and how what the outcomes they want. They could be an aggressive investor, or they could be kind of passive and for the long term, long term. So, how do different client objectives lead to different uses and outcomes of the AI? And if you can provide an example, that'd be even more the merrier. Well, I think you know Brad hit on it before. I mean, when you design a model and you say, okay, I'd like to you know pull off at least four percent income. You know, what's what's the input to that model? How much in fixed income? How much in dividend stocks? You know, what's going to be in that model? And then you can crank it. You know, you can dial it up. I like to use the you know term. We're we're you know changing the dials. We're pulling the levers. You know, and and you know rather than me manually sitting there, you know, looking at it on a hard spreadsheet. You know, if I can go into AI and go, this is what I'm trying to achieve and create this band of, you know, potential volatility, uh, you know, because everybody, you know, wants to make money in an up market. They don't want to lose money in a down market. But, you, you know, you got to be realistic and say, OK, Mr. and Mrs. Client, are you comfortable with, you know, drawdown? And you have to explain drawdown. OK, you got a hundred thousand dollar account. If you lose 20 grand, are you going to be upset? Yeah, I'm going to be upset. OK, you, you know, what can we do? you know, to get your portfolio going up and to the right with as little volatility as possible. So, I, you know, again, I, I think AI changes that conversation because it allows the advisor to more quickly, you know, build or put together, you know, portfolio, whether it's ETFs, mutual funds, or individual stocks. We only have so much time in a day. Right. We look at over 250 asset classes and for the average human to look at that and know what's cheap and what's expensive, it takes a decent amount of time. And Chris isn't just working on, you know, the, his investments all day. I'm not just working. We have clients. We have so many other tasks. We have marketing. We're trying to grow. This is an efficiency tool to be able to know and use AI to say, okay, what's cheap, what's expensive, and trying to use those, incorporate that into what we're trying to do. Same thing Chris is saying. We've had a huge run in growth. You know, has it gotten to a point where historically, okay, maybe we need to move from growth to a little bit of value to manage that portfolio? And we can use that. I call it scenario testing. I think what Chris was talking about in my mind is, you know, what's happened over the last, and we can ask it, is this market, what's it's most like in history? Is it like 2017 or 2009? What happened during those periods? What's my risk reward coming out of a period of, of high interest rates? And when the Fed you know, pauses, give me the last seven uh, periods that that happened. And we can get data very quickly to say, okay, well, this is what normally happens. These are the areas that normally do well. And we can ask those questions. But again, so you got to be, you got to know what you're doing to be able to ask those questions as well. Well, that's that's a great point. So let me ask you this then, or I could Tim, is ask a question for you. Are there templates or best practices REA should follow when creating prompts? So like for me, I use, I use AI for YouTube descriptions for my, for my podcast videos. And I have a very specific template saying, you know, use natural language, use keywords, use keep the character limit of a title to 60 characters because that's important mm -hmm. for YouTube. So what's the training going to look like for these RIAs and how long is it going to take to get, get them up to speed and up to snuff? I, I think that's, uh, we're, we're probably in the first inning on that. I mean, again, you, you know, literally in the last six months, the AI conversation is coming in, you know, to the RIA space and Hey, how do we use it? What do we do? That's why I think this video is very, very important. You know, what, what you guys are doing here today, because this is giving a lot of our viewers like, Hey, here's some guys that are using it. Here's what, you know, do, it's a make or buy decision. Do I go out there and try to figure this out myself or I, do I work with people that are already in this particular space? Uh, and, and again, we're probably in the first inning, you know, of this nine inning ball game as far as AI goes.
Well, Tim, can you talk about the, like yeah. the template uh, you were working on for an email? And that mm-hmm. was one of the things, and you, you're going to have, to me, you're going to have to have certain templates on how a research report gets spit out using AI and using some, uh, mm-hmm. you know, some financial information. That's the part where I think they're still not there. And I think it, they're starting to, but this idea of you have to ask it in the right way to be able to get something back to say, I want an email that sounds like this. I want it sounding you right. know, like uh, Jim Cramer wrote it or whatever. You can have those kind of things. Give me a little bit yeah. on what you've, you know, we, you were helping us a little bit on yeah. generating emails and how it, how it should, how it works. And a lot of the way that our system at QDEC is designed is when you ask a question, the first thing the AI does is determine what you're asking for. And then we sort of treat it as there's these different controlled sub procedures that it's going to follow. So it's not just like a free for all large language model, freely interpreting your question. Instead, each of these tasks is like a controlled, um, response that's going to follow some procedures. So if that procedure is going to go and get news data, find the right relevant response to your question, organize it, then use the large language model to compose, you know, the, the nicely flowed answer, or maybe it's going to go to the database and get market data and make a table of that market data and respond with that. And so similarly for like building things like media, whether it's, uh, you know, a uh, script for, a little video or whether it's an email or, you know, we're working on all sorts of different, uh, different variations there, focusing on things like emails and blog posts first. Um, we're definitely looking into having ways to structure that and even go in afterwards and edit it so that you could say, you know, ask the AI for information about an equity or a group of, a group of equities. Eventually, with QDEC, we'd like you to be able to ask the AI for information about a particular client's portfolio. It'll go and grab the equities from that client's portfolio, collect the information for you. And then you can say, okay, now I would like, you know, you to compose that information into an update email for this client. And then you could go in and make some edits to that email within the user interface there, you know, and sort of we're exploring these different intuitive ways to interact with the system. And to call back to a little bit ago, I think there is a bit of a learning curve for interacting with these tools and and kind of onboarding AI tools. But I think often that learning curve is actually less than the previous generation of tools that we've gotten familiar with at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, at least when I learned how to use Microsoft Excel, um, it took a lot just to learn how to, you know, understand all the different functions I could use and all the different hotkeys and how to move the data around. And now I do most of my data analysis with programming, but even then, right, it's, it's a sophisticated system with lots of different levers to pull. And with AI, we can make those levers in natural language. You can ask the system to do something for you, or you can interact with it in a really intuitive way. And so I think that we're actually in some ways going to be lowering the barrier to entry for the technology, at least for those firms and, uh, you know, for people like Chris and Brad who are, are ready to adopt it. <laughs> All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think that will do it for us. Let's do some closing thoughts. We've been going a little over an hour, gentlemen. It always surprised me how fast that goes. Um, so, Chris, final thoughts on AI for the RAA advisors and um, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, again, I, I hearken it back to, you know, what happened with ETFs. I mean, you know, the first exchange traded funds came out in 2000 and I'll never forget my peers going, why are you using those? I'm like, well, because they track the index, they're low cost uh, and they really helped me leverage my time, you know, flash forward 20 some years later, and, you know, people are like, hey, uh, AI, how are you going to use that? I'm like, well, it's going to leverage my time, you know, allow me to, be, you know, do my investment job better. So, you know, it, it, it's a transformative technology, uh, you know, that registered investment advisors, you know, will be embracing. We're still, I think, you know, probably in the first inning of it. I'm excited to see where this goes. But, you know, it's one of those things where, 
you know, every time, one of the reasons why I got in the investment business, I, I enjoy my career greatly, is that you're always learning something new. Uh, and, you know, this is this is a new area and it's very exciting. And, and like I said, I look forward to see what it looks like in the next five years. All right, Brad, most exciting and impactful aspect of AI that's going to impact your practice. What do you think? Well, and I, I think uh, Chris is exactly right in this. <laughs> what we do every day is we learn. Every day is different. I've never not. And to me, every day lasts about 15 minutes because it just you're always moving, but you need information. And so to me, this is a tool to get you information faster, makes you sound smarter, which obviously we all want to do. And to me, that's what it ends up being, a phenomenal tool to make you sound smarter, look smarter, and also, you know, and, and, and create a, your day in a much more efficient manner. And so that, that to me is where it's exciting. Uh, so no, I'm, I'm excited where it's going to go, but I totally agree with Chris. We're in the first inning. There's so many things that we can do on the data side from generative to marketing and, but it needs to be, it has to come to a point where it's usable and that we're, yeah. we're, we're getting close, but I do think yeah. we're, you know, we're three to six months away, I think, from saying, hey, this is something that everyone's using tomorrow. It's there today in certain use cases, but what you're going to use in three months is going to be 10 times more compared to what you can use it for today, I think. All right. And Tim, most exciting thing from a tech side, my man who, go, yeah. who goes behind the curtain. What are you most excited for? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that... Um, I sort of see near-term and long-term applications and the near-term applications that excite me the most are just this ability to, in the same way that Google kind of cracked open all of this knowledge that was stored on the internet for us, right? Where all of a sudden you could find anything and have it be in front of you in a couple seconds. I think we have a second wave here where and obviously I'm biased because this is the exact kind of tool that we're building at QDEC, right? But I think we have a second wave here where you'll be able to ask a system a question and have it retrieve that primary source information for you with the citations that take you back to that primary source and compose it to give you the answer, not in the form of links to websites, but in the form of just the answer right there. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess, uh, they always say that you need to be, bu um, building a tool that you want to use yourself. And, uh, it kind of has already gotten to the point where anytime I get a little alert from interactive brokers that, you know, there's a news headline. The first thing I do is copy my headline over into, uh, into QDEC that I really do think that ability to collect information rapidly and see what's happening and then follow it back to the sources. And that's the thing that is really compelling to me in the near term. I think that that's a problem that we're solving in a, in a, new, a new way that's really unlocked by AI. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much for being here today. I um, thank you for letting me host this, moderate this panel. It's been an absolute pleasure for me. But before we go, let's do one more time around the horn where we can find everybody if they want to work with you, get in touch with you. Any plugs you want to share? Now's the time to do it. Chris Engelberg, kick us off. Yeah, uh, you can go to our website, engelbertfa.com. We have tons of videos on there you can watch. Uh, we have our contact information. You can also download my app for your smartphone by texting Chris E, that's C-H-R-I-S-E, to 36260. Uh, I have a lot of content on my app. All right, Brad. SFGweb.com. Uh, you can you can see me there. I do a weekly podcast. Uh, you can see me, you know, hear me on those as well. And um, easy to reach out to us and uh, you know work with any any of our advisors. All right, and Tim. And uh, we're on QDEC.com, QDEC.ai, and uh, you'll find all of our different media there, as well as information about the QDEC platform and how you can use these AI tools yourself. All right. Chris, Brad, Tim, it's been an honor for me to be here. Who am I? My name is Will Tarashuk, the founder of Willie T Productions, a professional podcast host and your moderator for this panel. If you want to get in touch with me, let's go to LinkedIn. Will Tarashuk, T is in Thomas, A-R-A-S-H-U-K. If you want me to moderate your panel or host your podcast, it's very simple. You just reach out to me. All the uh, branding for the video will be in your branding, your fonts, your logos. If you're watching this on the replay, you're going to see it 
all around you. Clips and social media copy all included. Again, that's Will Tarashuk, T and Thomas, A-R-A-S-H-U-K on LinkedIn or Willie T Productions. That is plural, P-R-O-D-U-C-T-I-O-N-S info, I-N-F-O at gmail.com to get in touch with me and learn more about the power of podcasting, webinars, and how content can help grow your business and your brand. I do this for a living, so please reach out to me to host your stuff. We'll be back next time, or I'll be back next time. Next time you see me, who knows who I'll be talking to, but it's going to be a good old time. I hope to see you there. But until then, y'all take care.